Hey everyone, it's Rob Ryder. Uh, Monday, July 1st, 2013. And uh, don't really know where this is going to go yet, but this is what we're trying, and uh, let's see what happens. So what is it we're trying? Well, it's no more than we've been talking about, and that's start with getting a copy of a certificate of baptism, and I would go further. You should just get a certificate of your sacramental records, whatever they may be. Uh, if you were Catholic, you may have baptism and confirmation records, whatever they are, right? You get a certificate. And, but I think they just make a notation on one, but as you can see, it's very simple. This is certified that according to the records of this church, this good friend Bob Carr there in Pennsylvania says when he was baptized. See, it says born on. doesn't say birth date. It says born on. Um, goes on to say uh, where it's done at. And you can see there's a seal back here, so it's under the church seal. And it's even been updated that he was married. So, you know, that's basically what one will look like. And when you get one of these, well, what are we doing with it? Well, because of uh, what it says in the Episcopal Church, now that's for the United States, we have the Episcopal Church, the, whatever the Anglican Church is, wherever you are, it being a part of the Church of England, under the Sea of Canterbury, is one we're talking about. But here in America, it's called the uh, Episcopal Church. And in their canons, um, now this is at diocese level, because they have a canon law book for all of the Episcopal churches, and then they had another book for the canons of a particular church, or a particular diocese. And this came out of the Western Michigan Diocese, where in Canon 1 definitions, it says what a communicant in good standing is. And it shall include all persons who have received the sacrament of holy baptism with water in the name of the Father and of the Son, the Holy Spirit, whether of this church or in another Christian church. So whether you've done it there or in a different Christian church, doesn't matter, and whose baptism have been duly recorded in this church. So if you want to be a communicant in good standing, no matter what church you've been baptized in, you record it in this church, and they consider you a communicant in good standing. And actually, because you're over 16, if you are, you'll be an adult communicant of good standing. Now, this talks about one for in a congregation, but you know we're not talking about a particular congregation. I'm not in a congregation, but I'm still an adult communicant in good standing because I'm over 16 years of age. So I don't have to be in any particular congregation. It goes on to say that the Protestant Episcopal Church of the United States of America, otherwise known as the Episcopal Church, which name is hereby recognized also as designating the Church, is a constitute member of the Anglican Communion, a fellowship with the one holy Catholic and Apostolic Church, and whose duty, who duly constituted dioceses, provinces, and region churches in communion with the See of Canterbury. So the Episcopal Church is under the See of Canterbury, and it's in fellowship with the one holy Catholic and apostolic church, which means Roman Catholic, uh, Greek Orthodox, Russian Orthodox, you name them. All those are part of the one holy Catholic apostolic church because they all live by one thing, the Nicene Creed. If you can agree with the Nicene Creed, you're considered a Catholic. Uh, and it goes on for baptism, which is not only a sign of, of profession, a mark of difference whereby Christian men are discerned from others. So that's one thing that not that be not Christian, christened, but it is also a sign of regeneration or new birth. You're born again, whereby as an instrument, they that receive baptism rightly are grafted into the church. The promises of forgiveness of sin and our adoption to be sons of God by the Holy Ghost are visibly signed and sealed. Faith is confirmed. Confirmation. Grace increased by virtue of prayer unto God. Beautiful. Baptism allows you to be a prince of the church. Son of gods are kings of kings. You're one of the king of kings kings. It's a great place to be. But the civil authority doesn't know that we are. Uh, the power of civil magistrates, power of civil magistrates extended to all men as well, clergy and laity, in all things temporal, but hath no authority in things purely spiritual. And we hold it to be tr the duty of all men who are professed professors of the gospel to pay respectful obedience to the civil authority, 
regularly and legitimately constituted. In other words, there is a thing, certain thing called the civil authority that has uh, <laughs> its divinely ordained offices, ordained by God. But the courts we're walking into aren't those. And the, re the way you can tell is if you have a if you want to put in for um, a show cause, you have to do it by motion because uh, and you want to show cause why the plaintiff shouldn't be held in contempt of court for not producing a valid complaint. Well, that's considered indirect um, contempt of court, which means it's not happening in front of the civil authority. You're, you're actually in an ecclesiastic court that's run under the, uh, it's run under the laws of the Jews easy enough to find in the Talmud about how they treat a Gentile. And that's on one side. And Now it's been confirmed to us by a deacon of the Episcopal Church that there are two jurisdictions in the United States. There's the state and there's the church. The thing about the state is that nobody's really holding any state offices. They haven't taken a proper oath or they haven't um, accepted the position, right? They don't have a commission that, that they've signed off on. Um, and I've done enough other videos on that that it's just the way it is. They haven't done it. They're just assuming the office. The, you have usurped the offices of the state and now they're using the laws of the court of the Jew which has been recognized in England since the time that the uh, King John signed the Magna Carta, which was the constitution of the Jew with the King of England. And it made the Jews the king's property. And since they're the king's property, they have the king's protection. And if you have a complaint against a Jew, you need to take it to a king's officer. And the king's officers are the ones that are being hid from us. But because there's no separation of church and state in the realms of England, because Henry VIII kicked the Pope out of England, and he became both the temporal and spiritual leader of the country. There is no separation of church and state. That's why the Court of Chancery, which is run by ecclesiastics from um, the Episcopal Church, uh, and it's one of the four superior courts of England, it is the civil authority. It's the one that has equitable jurisdiction. It's the one that can give justice. And so a number of questions have been laid before a deacon. So many they had to go back and get some answered, but he's come back with, you're pretty much correct. And he didn't realize he had the powers that he does. And so one of the questions that was asked is we believe that we were given an office. Because everything in English law in the, in the realm of England is by the office. A king is an office. Right? And a man goes into the office of king and they have to do an inquest of office to determine the property of this man as the king. A bunch of deeds got to be signed over, whatever. Lots of, lots of paper had to change hands. And um, we've been given an office. We've just not claimed the office. A Christian man's goods, which are not common. The riches and goods of the Christian are not common. Touching on the right title and possession of the same as certain Anabaptists do falsely boast. So there's a group of Christians who say, no, it's not your property, it's our property. That's what an Anabaptist is. He doesn't believe that you own any property, that it's theirs to be for them to administer, and that's exactly what they're doing, is administering your property for you. Notwithstanding every man ought of such things he has possessed, liberally to give among alms to the poor according to his ability good stuff. And you can take an oath before the magistrate when he requires it. Now a Jew, he'll only take an oath on the Old Testament. And what's the front of part of the King James Version of the Bible? The Old Testament. Right? That has nothing to do with being a Christian. It's just history. There is no Sabbath to a Christian. Sunday is the day you worship. That was the day that God arose. Right? Yeah. You know, what, what about the Sabbath? Who cares? You care if you're a Jew, if you're a Christian, it doesn't mean anything to you. That covenant went out with the collapse of, of, of uh, 
Jerusalem in 70 AD. It's when Revelation happened. John the Apostle, who wrote Revelation while he was exiled to, I think it was Panamos, he was exiled during the reign of uh, Nero. And if you take Nero, I think it's Caesarea, from the original Greek and put the letters into the Hebrew to get the numerical value, guess what it adds up to? 666. If you take a er very early Latin version of a Bible and did the same thing because the characters are different, it would have a different value. 616. And in those Bibles, that's what it says the mark of the beast is. 616. Revelation happened a long time ago. So, now here's the interesting part. Now this is in the um, Constitution of the Anglican, or of the um, Episcopal Church. If I say Anglican, Episcopal, Church of England, they're all the same. The original 1751-1662 text of the article. The King's Majesty hath no chief power in this realm of England, or hath the chief power of this realm in England, and other his dominions, unto whom the chief government of all the states of this realm whether they be ecclesiastic or civil, in all causes do appertaineth, and is not, nor not ought to be subject to any foreign jurisdiction. Well, when they say the king's majesty, majesty is generally applied to God, so they're saying the king's God has the chief power, and the king still believed Jesus Christ was the Savior. He just wasn't too happy with the Pope, because he wouldn't give him a uh, divorce. Although the Pope wanted to, but pfft, Henry had married up, man. His wife was the niece, I believe the niece, of the Emperor of Rome. <laughs> and the Pope did need the did need to have the argument. They were already arguing. Whether we attribute to the king's God, the chief government, by which titles we understand the minds of some slanderous folks to be offended, we give not our princes the ministering of either God's word or the sacraments, the which thing the injunctions also lately set forth by Elizabeth our Queen do most plainly testify. So now they're talking about princes, that the king is actually a prince, and they don't give the king to minister God's word. They're not an ordained, they're not ordained priest, it's the king's prince, and he's not saying he's going to give, minister God's word or give the sacraments. That would still be done by the ordained priest. But he's a Christian prince. But that only prerogative which we see to have been given always to all godly princes in Holy Scripture by God himself, that it, that is, that they should rule all the states and degrees committed to their charge by God. They should rule their estate and their office. The godly princes, princes of the church, And it was given to you by God himself. You've been given an office. But the Bishop of Rome hath no jurisdiction in the realm of England. Now remember, this is in the Constitution of the Church of England and the Anglican Church. The Bishop of Rome hath no jurisdiction in the realm of England. And the Bishop of Rome doesn't, but the Pope does. As the Bishop of Rome, he doesn't have any more jurisdiction than the Bishop of Grand Rapids has to the realm of England. As the Pope, it'd be a different story. And the, the laws of the realm may punish Christian men with death for heinous and grievous offenses. It is lawful for Christian men at the commandments of the magistrate to wear weapons and serve in times of war. Therefore, if somebody claims to be a Christian in the law in the realm of England, and they do heinous or grievous offenses, such as be a false accuser, break a commandment, they can be charged with death. They could be charged as a heretic. So, because of what this says, and what we've gotten from answers so far to some tentative questions and waiting with bated breath for the rest of the answers, um, I wrote this today, and I, I sent this as an email, and so I'll just read it. This is going to an archdeacon of uh, the local diocese. Greetings, sister. And I, I had her title up there. I just took it off. I don't need to put it on, but I had her title up there. Greetings, sister. I am that I am. Amen. Robert Allen, the immortal living spirit within Robert Allen Rutluski, announcing my return from the desert of the world and now standing at the gateway into the garden here on earth. 
There are any number of like-minded souls on the same journey returning to the light who have recently, by divine intervention, been drawn in a particular direction by faith and deed, utilizing holy scriptures, books of the laws of England, estate, property, commercial, Roman rite, Episcopal canon, and many other books for the various forms of law, history of the church, ancient civil societies, cartoons, movies, we search for signs that lead to a new reality. That's why I look at it. Our findings lead us to the door of the Episcopal Church in its unique position as the ordained civil authority within the realms of England to administer equity and justice via the Court of Chancery, it being one of the four superior courts of English law as the Court of Equity. Would it surprise you to know that God's children are subject to false accusations by those pr practicing Protestant legalism, simulating a legal process by use of Judeo-Christian beliefs? Yes, as you read this, somewhere not far away, another falsely accused human being is standing before a black-robed priest who has assumed the role of judge, no lawful commission. The result will be the confiscation of property, lands, and spirit, false imprisonment, torture, and torment. In one way or other, God's children will be martyred at the altar of the false accuser. Many claiming authority have only assumed the office as usurpers. They do not have valid oaths, commissions, or acceptance of offices properly recorded. This includes not only court officers, but supposed state, county, local government officers, policing authorities, and attorneys. The constitutional offices of the state have been vacated and being usurped. <clears throat> While I'm not sure what denomination of Christian these false accusers and co-conspirators profess to belong to, they are certainly not the civil authority of the Christian nation, and run their ecclesiastic tribunals by the way of the Jew, not the Christian, not requiring the accuser to swear to his complaint, take an oath, or provide testimony, nor full proof evidence. The plaintiff is a fictitious entity, as is the defendant. This in itself is contempt of court. Errors and omissions on court documents, no judicial seals, no proper notice, no following of any court procedure except one, i.e., secret signs. According to the Talmud, in the court of the Jew, a Gentile can be legally cheated. This is how the courts of the assumed state operate. They are not lawful tribunals. They use deceit, threat, coercion, and duress to get your consent to their arbitrators, the judge's decision, that can then be lawfully enforced by a civil law. These courts were made part of the contracts, including the Magna Carta, that the kings of England entered into with the Jew, making the Jew the property of the king of England, and as the king's property, having the king's protection. In the time of Christ Jesus, the Jew had no king but Caesar. In the realms of England, they have no king but the sovereign of England. These ancient contracts form the basis of English common law, the law of the land. One of the requirements of these contracts was that if a Christian had a complaint against a Jew, he had to lay, had to be laid before one of the king's officers. These officers of the king have been concealed from us, but should be known to you, as you are one of them. There are, all, there may already be king's officers within the state court system charged in keeping the king's peace, such as a justice of the peace, royal coroner, or clerics but they are concealed. It is why there are two separate and distinct jurisdictions here in America, being that of the church and that of the God of the state. The church represents the Jews' law of the land. The, the, the state represents the Jews' law of the land. The church represents Christ's grace, justice, and equity. The Episcopal Church represents the civil authority of England and America. The state is granted its authority by the church. The state's office have been usurped and it is duty of the church to take superintending control via the court of chancery and its writs under the great seal. This deacon in Arizona said that the church's seal is the center of the state seal, and the center of the state seal is the coat of arms of Arizona. So that's the most fundamental. And if you put a ring around the outside, it means the thing on the inside is given the outside the jurisdiction, because you just... Um, modified the, the fundamental. It's like the word law. Law by itself is the strongest. Civil law, common law, any other kind of law is just a piece of law. But law is everything. That coat of arms is everything. The seal on the outside means that that agency got its authority from the coat of arms and the coat of arms is held by the church. 
the state exists at the at the pleasure of the church and there's nobody holding those offices these topics could be and should be discussed for hours but my reason for contacting you today is quite simple I believe we have we the faithful have been granted an ecclesiastic office by baptism and confirmation however to claim this office we must be domiciled in Rome the church not a resident of Michigan the state our residence in Rome is established by attaining the status of communicant in good standing as defined in the Episcopal Diocese of West Michigan, Canon 1, wherein we record our sacramental records with the Episcopal Church. This would be public notice of our faith and choice of jurisdiction we wish to abide. And there's two jurisdictions, the state and the church, so said the deacon. When the faithful are baptized, they are adopted by the Heavenly Father as one of his children, later confirmed anointed princes of the Universal Catholic Church, and granted the office of cardinal at the age of 22, as long as we reside in Rome, have our office published, and meet with the Pope, or have prior papal authority to reside elsewhere, in which case his emissaries deliver the ornaments of office. You get a seal as a cardinal. As the Bishop of Rome has no jurisdiction in the realms of England, our desire to claim our office must come through the diocese under the See of Canterbury. Through a diocese under the See of Canterbury. Therefore, it is my desire to register my sacramental records with the Episcopal Church in accordance with Canon One of your diocese canon law, as defined under community good, good standing, and petition for an inquest of office. As a prince of the Church, my intention is to protect the faith by use of the sword of civil law, rebuking the false accusers and seeing that justice is made available to every man's front door. I wish to participate in the liturgy with the one holy Catholic and apostolic church as a cardinal protector. Competent to testify, I make you aware of treason and felonies, transgressions of civil law, schism and heresy within the king and king's domain, and it would be misprison if the civil authority ordained by God were to knowingly allow continuance of such behavior. I will provide the bill of complaint. What I need is access to the civil authority and it to inquire into the probable cause based on recorded evidence by writ of quo warranto. I am collecting certificates of my sacramental records for recordation in the Episcopal Church. I believe this is done through the local parish, but I'm sure they will I am sure they will be unaware of such thing as possible. I ask your intercession on my behalf with the local parish secretary, informing them to register my sacramental records as required by the canon. I believe the closest Episcopal parish to be St. Paul's in Greenville, Michigan. When you have time, I would truly appreciate an opportunity to talk to you. I spend most waking hours studying, contemplating, and looking for signs of the kingdom of heaven here on earth. It's here, right here, if and when we make it so. Phone number, your brother Robert Allen. I believe all that stuff in the heart. That's the way I think it's supposed to work. Now, why do I think we what office we would get? Because it's already been pretty much agreed that, yeah, you do have an office. We just need to do a little more checking. Well, there's a thing called the Prince of the Church, the Prince of the Empire, the Prince of the Faith, the Prince Electors, the Roman Princes, Prince Provost. They all mean the same thing. By analogy with secular princes, in a broader sense of a ruler of any principality regardless of the style, it made perfect sense in feudal class society to regard the highest members of the clergy, mainly the prelates, by the privileged class estate, similar to the nobility ranking just below or even above it in a social order. <clears throat> in Europe, it became common for the younger sons of dynastic houses to seek careers in the church hierarchy, especially when they expected to be excluded from the succession members of the royal family and the aristocracy began to occupy many of the highest prelatures. The term Prince of the Church is used exclusively for Catholic Cardinals. However, the term is historically more important as a generic term of clergymen whose office hold the secular rank and privileges of a prince. You don't need to be ordained bishop, priest, or anything. Secular rank as a cardinal. And are considered its equivalent. In, in the case of cardinals, they have always treated in protocol as equivalent to royal princes. The term cardinal was originally understood every priest permanently attached to a church, every clerk, either eh, by I can't remember what those words are, 
It became the usual designation of every priest belonging to a central or Episcopal church, an ecclesiastic. Lastly, it was equivalent to Principalis, i.e., excellent, superior, and is also used by St. Augustine in De Baptismo, which I wish I could find a copy of, see what St. Augustine said about that. Now, St. Augustine is early 2nd century prophet, one of the four fathers of the church. Man was a little party animal. He wrote a whole confession about his life, and he still got to be a saint. It's good to be Catholic. Now, this is a good thing. In immense persecution of a cardinal, personal injury to or imprisonment of him are counted high treason. Not only the principals, but also those intellectually responsible for the wrong, the originators, participants, auxiliaries, and their male descendants incur canonic, can, canon, canonical penalties of infamy, confiscation, loss of testamentary rights, and civil offices, and excommunication. It's wonderful that they said high treason, because it's different than treason. Treason, they shoot you, hang you, guillotine. High treason is drawn and quartered, hung by the neck till you're just about dead, cut your privates off, throw them on the fire, disembowel you, throw on the fire, let you watch. That's high treason in English law. A crown cardinal was a cardinal protector of the Catholic nation, nominated and funded by a Catholic monarch to serve as a representative within the College of Cardinals, and if applicable, exercise uh, Jews exclusive, which means you could kick the Pope out. The cardinals elect the Pope, the cardinals can impeach the Pope. More generally, the term may refer to any cardinal significant as a secular statesman or elevated at the request of a monarch. And the monarch, Jesus Christ, through his vicar, made you a cardinal. He made you a... If you climb the ladder, you can be a prince of the church. Francis Burke Young defines crown cardinal as one elevated to cardinate solely on the recommendation of the European kings and without, in many cases, having performed any service at all for the advance of the church. You don't need to be part of the church or towards its advance to be a cardinal. And then there's cardinal priest, right, which we would think of some priests are cardinals. In other words, an ecclesiastic division of a city of various parochial purposes is attributed to popes of the 2nd and 3rd century. Now these cardinal priests they're talking about, I think, are the same as, well, there you go, presbyters and deacons. These presbyters were thenceforth known as cardinals. <clears throat> However, not all the numerous priests attached to these churches were known as cardinals, but in keeping with the current use, as the equivalent of principles, only the first priest in each church, such as a archpresbyter, archdeacon. So an archdeacon sounds like it's a cardinal. According to the Constitution of John, published in 873, these cardinal priests, presbytery cardinalists, were supervisor of ecclesiastic jurisdiction in Rome and also ecclesiastic judges. So it sounds like an archdeacon or archpresbytery is an ecclesiastic judge. And what we're pointing out is that another Christian, right, isn't following God's law. Nothing wrong with that. We're not charging them. We're charging their deed. That's what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to kick the fucking transgressor's ass out of the kingdom of heaven and we could be living in paradise. That is, the Pope commands them to meet at least twice a month in their own or other churches to investigate their own lives and those of the clergy, the relations of superiors and inferiors, and in general to check all violations of laws to settle as far as possible in papal court all conflicts between laymen and ecclesiastics. Now this deacon told uh, Joe that they have faith work that somebody in their church gets in trouble, they come in and they fill it out at the diocese and whatever it was goes away. They don't get traffic tickets. Imagine that. The Pope, he says, is like Moses in gentleness of government while the administration of the cardinals recalls the paternal character of the 70 elders who sat as judges under the patriarch's control. That's Deuteronomy. Moses is talking to his 70 judges. And I think that's who these archdeacons are. Or it could be, see, because they talk about deacons here also. But they're talking about archdeacons above, and I don't think they're about archdeacon here, although they might. However, they have another office in uh, 
the uh, Episcopal Church, and it's called a canon. And an archdeacon is somebody who hasn't been canonized. Well, a canon must have been canonized. I guess that's why he's a canon. But if you get canonized, you get you were made into a saint. And powerful stuff happened in that church. The name deacon means only minister or servant. Besides the clergy attached to the Roman Church, there was in a city, regionary clergy, almost of equal antiquity, so-called because of relations of ecclesiastic regions or quarters into which, after the fashion of municipal regions, Christian Romans were at the early date divided. For the care of the poor, the city was divided into seven regions, each of which was administered by a deacon. And uh, this is from Clement in 88 AD. Hope that's early enough for you all. He divided the city into seven regions and assigned them to as many faithful notaries of the church, whose duty it was to earnestly and carefully to collect in each region the acts of the martyrs. Well, what's an act of the martyr? In the strictest sense, the act of the martyrs are the official records of trials of the early Christian martyrs made by notaries of the court. And a martyr just means you're a witness for Christ, witness for God. But if you were a Christian and you were martyred, right, by a false accuser, well, apparently these guys can go get the records. The Calendaria, where a list of martyrs celebrated in different churches, according to their, okay. Uh, and then this guy in 99 said he divided among the priests the titles of the city of Rome and ordained seven deacons to bear witness to the preaching of the bishop. Much more credible is a statement from Fabian in 236. He divided the regions among the deacons and created seven subdeacons whom he placed over the notaries that the later might collect the fidelity and completeness of the acts of the martyrs. And we were told by a circuit court clerk in Santa Fe, she agreed that her oath was held by a bishop. She could be filling this role as a subdeacon. He also commanded many buildings to be put on cemeteries. In this way, there arose in each of the regions an edifice for the reception of the poor and close by the church. In 1630, cardinals were taking the style eminence in accordance with tradition. They signed by placing the title cardinal after the personal name. However, it says several influential style books, both secular and religious, indicate that the correct form of referring to a cardinal in English is as cardinal Robert Allen Ritlewski. This style is also generally found on websites of the Holy See and the Episcopal Conferences. So, Cardinal, name, surname. You won't be a mister any longer. The head of the Cardinal Deacons was the Archdeacon, also known as, okay, in his quality, a supervisor of, okay, so the Archdeacon is in charge, a supervisor of ecclesiastic discipline in the city, so he is the judge and curator of the papal finances. He was, after the Pope, the most important person in Rome during the Middle Ages. Uh, so I don't know if I have time to get through all this because i got quite a few pages to go. Anyways, this is just m many things about cardinals, and I'll pass it on, but I'm going to read, just look at the highlight stuff. Uh, in the meeting of a consistory, uh, Middle Ages were frequently held weekly. The cardinals assisted the Pope in disposition of overwhelming mass of lawsuits. That's what we're going to do. The cardinals were also, grand, were also grand inquisitors, which is why we're asking for an inquest of office. Likewise, rectors in st states of the church. In conduct of diplomatic negotiations, it's easy to understand how all cardinals, including cardinal priests and cardinal deacons, came to outrank bishops and archbishops. Uh, the argument appeal, the argument for argument appeal was made to seventy elders of Moses and in Deuteronomy that the cardinal in a body should come immediately after the Pope and should precede all others in the church. The cardinals were on an equality with emperors and kings whom they addressed as brothers. It was only natural, therefore, in the, in the end of the name cardinal until the late Middle Ages was born the by principal ecclesiastics of the more important churches should be reserved for Roman cardinals until the late Middle Ages. And a lot of things changed in England in the Middle Ages and this was the thing they did to change it. There were never any cardinals by birth. Right? And all we have now are birth certificates. We need to be born. No other office necessarily implied elevation to the dignity of a cardinal. You don't have to have any other office to be made a cardinal. 
uh, basically this about the Pope the Cardinals choose the Pope and they can oppose on new bishops by their chapters, prevented the appointment of new cardinals, allied themselves, at least individually, with the civil power against the Pope. That was under capitulations. And in 1409, now there's a thing called the Western Schism in 1409, and apparently at that time there were three people claiming to be the Pope. Go figure. No wonder some people were pissed off. Well, the College of Cardinals convoked a conference, or whatever they did, the Council of Pisa and put an end to it. And they said, from now on, we're going to elect the Pope. If it didn't come from us, it didn't happen. In the nomination of cardinals, the Pope has always been and still free. The Pope can do it. He's the Vicar of Christ. In the medieval period, according to the detailed account given by Cardinal somebody, uh, work of early 14th century, the Pope was wont to ask the cardinals for their opinion as to the new members of the college, but afterwards decided quite freely. The above mentioned uh, election capitulator, which the Council of Basel demanded that the nomination of cardinals should be made dependent on the consent of the college. According to the man of reform councils, the decree of the Council of Trent, there should be a college representative of all Christian nations. I think your last name is a Christian nation. Similarly, they are wont to provide for the support of their respective national cardinal protectors. At the Vatican Council, and demand to be made the sacred college Okay, so I want to get to this last part. Uh, must receive deacon's orders within a year, otherwise he loses the pass. Okay, a person nominated must have the qualifications of a bishop, i.e., he must therefore be at least 30 years of age. That's all you need to be. However, for cardinal deacons, it suffices to have entered on 22nd year, but a new cardinal deacon must receive deacon's orders within a year, otherwise he loses passive and active role. So other than that, you need to be 30 years old. But you can, if you're younger than that, go for the cardinal deacon. Take whatever office they have. And keeping the provisions of promotion to nobility, illegitimates, even when it legitimated by later marriage, are ineligible. Yeah, but we were adopted by God. Of course, folk can occasionally dispense with these disqualifying conditions. Cardinals can, cardinals take place in a secret consistory during which those actually resident in Rome are informed of their nomination. So if you were in Rome, you would get a nomination. In the afternoon, the same day that newly recreated cardinal meets in the Pope's apartments, in the antechamber of which the scarlet skull cap is handed to them. Thereafter, the scarlet beretta is placed on by the Pope on the head of each. The red hat is given in the next public consistory after they have taken the customary oath. So you got to take an oath, and at the beginning of the next secret consistory takes place ceremony known as all opening of the mouth, closing of their same consistory, closing of the mouth, symbolizing their duties to keep secrets of their office and to give wise counsel to the Pope. You'd better be able to keep your mouth shut. A ring is then given to each, and at the same time the title of the church by which the new cardinal shall henceforth be known. If the so that if you want to know what your true name is, title and true name. Well, we'll see. Title or church for which the new cardinal shall henceforth be known. You're going to get a new name. At the creation of the cardinal takes place outside of Italy. The beanie is sent to him by one of the Pope's noble guards and the scarlet hat by special Abelgate. Occasion is conferred uh, by some distinguished prelates, especially delegated by the Pope. Formerly, the dignity of a cardinal was acquired only after public proclamation and reception of a hat and ring. At present, any form of publication suffices. A testimary, but a testimony publication does not suffice. The publication of the names may, in given circumstances, be made at a much later date. Only at whatever time such publication takes place, the cardinal so created rank and seniority according to the date of their original announcement as reserved in pedo in the chest and preceded all those created after that time. By virtue of canonical can can obedience, the Pope could, could compel an unwilling person to accept cardinal dignity. But please, man, make me take it. The oath taken by the cardinals is quite similar to that taken by bishops. By the cardinal must swear that he will defend conscientiously the papal bulls concerning non-alienation of possession 
not splitting the titles of the possessions of the Roman Church, nepotism, papal elections, likewise his own cardinal dignity. You must protect your dignity. Hence the cardinal is obliged to reside at Rome and cannot leave the papal states without permission of the Pope. The violation of law entails great penalties, even loss of cardinal dignity. That's what happened to us. We're not residing in Rome, we're residing in the state of Michigan. Certainly they lose all their benefits possessed by them. Okay, so this goes on and on. I'll send it along, and it's interesting reading, but you can find it by all this, these types of things by going to newadvent.org online. So we're going to see where this leads, but that's what we're doing. We're having a lot of fun. If you want to ask me what you should do, go get your baptismal certificate and talk to me in a week. All right, see ya.